NGS School. And I'm pleased to introduce our second speaker, Professor Isabella Makawowska. Uh, professor Makawowska is a professor of biological sciences and director of the Institute of Biology and Human Evolution at the Adam Mickiewicz University, Poznan, Poland. Uh, she's also a CEO in a bioinformatics company called Ideas for Biology, founded in 2013 in Poland. Uh, and Professor Makowska has led numerous studies on epigenomics, gene expression, and gene regulation in a wide range of species from uh, plants to humans. Uh, with her research groups, she is actively developing various biological databases, such as histone sequences, DNA sequences, microRNAs, and retrogenes, which is the topic of her talk today. I'm excited to learn more about retrogenes and her research experience on this topic, and we welcome everyone listening to ask questions. So for Professor Makowska, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks, Eva. Start out the presentation. So, could you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, so as you know, I mean the the title of, of my presentation is genes quite a bit better, but before I get to that, I like to thank all organizers actually for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, uh, the research is ongoing uh, in up and this. Uh, maybe a little bit unique topic of, uh, of retrogenes. Uh, so I will actually start with, start with historical event, event that took place in Washington in the year 2000, where the White House, it, it was announced that the sequencing of the human genome was finished. And actually, there was the announcement of two projects, the public project, project and private project. Um, we all had had really a lot of hopes if it comes to what we'll find in the uh, in this human genome, and especially when the project started 13 years earlier. Uh, we really believe, believe when we will find or well, well, sequence the genome, you know, identify all proper protein coding genes, then we actually be able to to um, diagnose all genetic diseases and find the cure and, and, and so on. So at this first moment, uh, pres President Clean uh, said that, that the, the thing, the human genome, genome will allow for diagnostics, prevention, and disease treatment. And Francis Collins, who was at that moment the director of Human Genome Research Institute, Institute uh, this was the leading institution in uh, public uh, uh, project uh, said that the human genome sequence will allow in 10 to 15 years to recognize key elements crucial, crucial in three diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, also, uh, over 20 years later, and we know that we still don't know the basis of many uh, human gen human genetic disease. We can't can't explain them. We don't don't have actual good treatment for for many of those diseases. Uh, and this personalized medicine uh, exists, but it's actually at the very 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 low uh, low level, level. Expected to have I mean I mean my advanced personalized personalized uh, uh, now. Uh, so we may we may ask a question. Why actually did it did it happen? Right. I mean, we know the, the human genome, we know the protein called genes, and the answer is actually simple because the genome came with a lot of surprises. And this came not from, from protein codings, uh, uh, although we were hoping those are the key keys, main keys, or the only keys to human diseases. Uh, but but from all art that at the, at the moment the human genome pro project started seemed to be not in interested. There were even some some ideas that maybe we shouldn't sequence this entire genome. Maybe sequencing transcriptome would be good enough because who cares best about the rest? Uh, so so uh, well, actually over over time about a lot, lot of ele genomic elements that we did not have any idea they exist. Uh, we uh, discovered, I mean, a lot of regula regulatory mechanisms, uh, and we still are not sure, and, and we still didn't answer all questions when it comes to human genome. And one of those uh, surprise, surprise 
were actually pseudo pseudo. Uh, or, uh, or knew that the genes exist, exist of ours, but those are con con were considered mostly as a bro broken genes. So nobody really was interested in this. Yeah, we knew there are some pseudo genes in the human uh, in the human genome. Uh, and before before we actually the analysis of some pseudo genes, let's let's look where they came from. Uh, so there are three different main, main parts of the genes. Uh, one to origination of pseudo genes. So one is very, one is very simple. So why do we have a protein, a protein called the genes? Um, it, um, it may acute some mutation and, and we get some unitary pseudo genes. Another way is a duplication. So this gene, so called parental gene, uh, may uh, be, be duplicated, uh, for example, example in an crossing over event. And we have a complete gene functional, but this is genius. the genes are also accumulating mutations and, 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 and generally degrade. Uh, why it's so, it's so? I mean, well, two copies of some, some genes, it's not, benefit. It's not, not always beneficial. Uh, so, so sometimes silencing one of them actually uh, is, is, um, increases the fitness of, of the so we don't in some, we don't really need so much of, uh, of the of the product. There is another way, another way of getting uh, subgenes uh, based on the RNA based mechanism, which we call retroposition. So in this mechanism, the gene is the gene is actually transplanted and the mature mRNA. This mRNA is, is reverse transcribed into cDNA and incorporated back into the gene. And of course, it also uh, accumulates uh, mutations. There is one big di big difference between these two gr groups of genes. Uh, so, in case of duplication, if the if if the gene is duplicated, they usually at the beginning are functional and accumulate accumulate mutations. When it, com it comes to genes, um, these genes actually are not functional at the moment when they are incorporated into the genome because the RNA doesn't have any regulatory elements. So, so they don't promote us and say that they are dead, dead on their own uh, because uh, they don't function. And then of course, they emulate uh, mutations over, uh, over time. When you look at the depths from the by by function point of view, they they just troublemakers because right because we know that they, that they are the cause of false positive positive predictions and unwanted dust matches and they problematic in RNA seq data mapping. Uh, so if bioinformaticians think about think about uh, they rather think think about them as a glimpse and not see something that is uh, that that is interesting. So as many other people, it's mostly considered just a, just as a giant, right? Uh, and and uh, in many analyses, this is actually the existence of them I mean, is ignored. Uh, so let's look at the, actually at this junk. So in so 2017, I mean, there was this new issue, issue of genetics journal. Now, at, at the kind of this journal, we see a crash bit with, of course, some trash and a piece of DNA. And this DNA is, is actually really, and is yelling something. So, well, let's, well, let's see. Maybe yelling just because, because you don't understand, you can't come as just junk. And I mean, assuming this could be what this DNA is yelling, we thought, well, well maybe we should actually look at it and try to understand them. And we focused pretty, pretty much on those uh, the genes originated with the via retro transposition. Uh, they are quite char characteristic because they usually run single exogenes. Um, they uh, very often have also poly A pairs, and there are these this tandem on both sides, mates, which are remains of the uh, radiation into uh, the genome. So, to understand retro genes, the first step is of course to identify them. Identify them. So we used by used bioinformatics to anal analyze over 90 animal and plant genomes to look for retrocopies copies, because in majority of those genomes there were no annotations of retrocopies whatsoever. whatsoever. 
uh, and with, with such analysis, it's actually in every case in bioinformatics. So we always have to choose, right, between the rate of horse uh, um, of, of positives and negatives. And we always have to put the border somewhere. And here also we had to, as usual, set up some parameters and some, some procedure uh, to identify the copies. And we actually actually imagine that we will, we will uh, select a right a rather strange, stringent criteria because we really wanted to, to avoid those positive results. So we thought, well, we, we rather miss some regimes that have some uh, pieces of the sequences that not are ret retro copies or copies at all. Uh, so to make to make the story, I mean, we looked at, at the pieces of bone that had a, had a, had a high similarity to a known uh, protein, and we also looked for the signals of loss of loss of uh, loss of introns. Um, and this is the example of some of some animals where of these retro copies is we found. And we can see that in all placental mammals, actually there are thousands of such uh, uh, retinas in the genome, even you know, uh, to other animals, animals or plants, the story is this different number is not uh, very good. But this is really intriguing. Why this assuming junk DNA is really kept in this, in this mammalian I mean, so we have the next question, uh, why kept in the genome now? Uh, because when you think about it, it doesn't seem to be reasonable because with every cell duplication to replicate this genomic, genomic matter. So you have to, you have to replicate thousands of genes, which do not think are actually broken. Uh, uh, so this is, this is really, was really intriguing, and the first step to understand this and get some answers was actually, was actually to use retro copies of these are true in them. I mean, so, so apparently the copies over the ev evolution they acquire uh, regulatory elements, and some of them, and actually quite quite a lot, uh, get expressed. First, uh, we look at that uh, identified by by as retro copies. In the RNA, RNA seq data of over 800 experiments, and we found over 1,500 expressed retrocopies. And we can see that some of them were expressed in many, many, uh, in many, in many samples, and some were expressed at quite high, uh, quite a high level. We also look across tissues, and we notice that, that we have a number of number of retrogenes ubiquitously expressed. And we also, also found some cells and tissues that, that had a big retrogenes activities, for example, spleen. So, so far, we knew that there is a quite a good activity of, of retrogenes in testes, uh, but spleen was something, something, something new. Uh, so, uh, so, so obviously, obviously, in retrogenes are not really so, really so much that, at least part of, the, of their real being alive. Uh, so next question is what they actually can do what they are good for. I mean, why they are getting expressed? They may, they may be just transcription and no, and noise and do. Uh, uh, so in cartoon, we actually, actually see different putative fun functions. And on the left side, there is the process of reposition in more details, but this is not this is not probably important um, um, to, 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 to go into there. So, but let's look at look at these functions, how the ret retrocopies evolve. So after we have gene duplicates, we have a different patterns of evolution. Uh, so the gene may, act, may actually share function with its parent, and we call this process subfunctionization, right? So they, for example, may act at different places or at different time. Sometimes, sometimes they develop a novel fun function, and we call it this, this process neuronalization. Uh, they also may be replaced the parental gene. So when we have a two copies, sometimes uh, actually the parental gene degrade. So we call these genes orphan genes. The genes don't have a parent anymore. anymore. And on, on this, in the space of neurofunction functionalization, uh, actually, actually, at least theory, they, they can acquire other functions than protein functions. 
Uh, so they, for example, may have a lot of regulatory functions through transcriptional interfer interference or genetic regula regulation. They may become a summer source for RNAs or, or trans natural antisense transcripts or micro RNA exposures. Uh, so there's a lot of mechanisms where this, uh, uh, this letter may, uh, uh, may act. So let's see just some of them. Uh, well, first, protein coding. Well, when we were looking at those identified, identified retrocopies, we found that 100 known protein coding genes were actually retrogenes. So those are retrogenes that very quickly acquired uh, regulatory uh, elements and become And we also found seven retrocopies that, piece that provided super novel exosomes. Uh, so this is the example just of one. Uh, such a retrocopy, uh, it got inserted into intron of this, this gene, and then the sequence was used, used for alternatively spliced like variants. So the two last last exons in the short the short variant um, came from from retrogen from retrogenic sequence. Uh, okay, this, this is fine, but I think this is not extremely exciting. Uh, the better question is actually what the other. Uh, uh, Retrocopies do, and uh, so so we wonder if the other retrocopies actually also encode uh, proteins or maybe just some short peptides. And we decided to ut utilize uh, uh, ribosome pooling data to look association between these recopies and well transcripts, those retrocopies and ribosomes. We know that the association. Uh, of course, when things are produ produced, and we have this, this ribosome mm, mm, procedure in which uh, it's possible to isolate the pieces of transcripts that are associated actually with, actually with ribosome, and then some sequence that map to the trans transcriptome or to, to, to the gen genome. And if you signal in the coding sequence, well, that may mean that the particular transcript is actually translated into into protein. Uh, uh, but didn't really want to do, do this based on this. On this, I adapted the, uh, the approach that was used by other, other researchers uh, to start, study long code RNAs. And we decided to take advantage of RNA and ribosic data together with RNA seq data because it's not it's not important if they in association with the cells. But also we need to know what the function of particular transcripts gets in this association, right? Could, could this be a function of particular gene? Uh, we uh, uh, used the data available in a public database and we selected the data set of 26 samples uh, of RNA-seq and ribosync, of, of, of course, from a pro probes. And we looked at, at the ribosome density. Uh, so first we calculate RNA seq cover, coverage, ribosome cover, coverage, and truly divide divided our data three sets. So we look at coding sequences of non protein coding genes. Uh, we looked at the three prime tiers of protein coding genes, and those were actually in our references. And of, and of course, get the retrocopy copies. And um, this refers references and we get a represent type of sequence sequences because uh, at RNA basic level, we expect similar coverage. But when we look at the ribosome, we expect much higher coverage in CDS sequences than in uh, uh, three primaries. And you can see, see in this particular one ex example that truly. The, the coverage of uh, ribosome data is much lower in in three prime TRs. So then we calculated this ribosome, the ribosome density, and uh, uh, actually for ret retrocopies that may that meet the criteria of uh, being associated with ribosome. So of course, after some uh, uh, analysis where we removed removed outliers, and then we calculated. Decided to choose, choose a z score equal to 1.64, calculated for three prime ETR data set to use this as a cutoff, cutoff level and get everything to the right uh, as, as having a relation with 
ribosome. Uh, so, so we see the green residents, of course, three prime MTR. Uh, there is not much really. Uh, the, the distribution of three prime MTR ribosome density and the cells really, uh, they don't over the over much. When we look at the heterogeneous, I mean, they actually cover both distributions. Uh, but the big part of this, I mean, uh, had the values very, very similar uh, uh, coding, coding sequences. So we have found over 700 heterocots that demonstrated uh, ribosome in 10 or more libraries. So those were not just a single event, single event found it in, in at least two libraries. So this is, a, this is a really very evidence, but uh, well, I mean, we want to dig back more in the data and actually take advantage of all its available. So we decided also to look at, look at mass spectral data. We know, we know that this is unique that measures the mass charge ratio. Uh, what actually we really get to analyze biopharmaticians are short peptide uh, sequences. And, and we use that sequences uh, on a I mean, number, number of experiments. And we, we pretty looked for the peptides that they uniquely match retrocopy, but not in fingers. So if we found the peptide that was it was marental gene and retrocopy, copy it actually rejected it. the dose that match it match one single gene and in and as retrocopy uh, uh, was then uh, taken in consideration. And at the end of this part, we actually combine the data. So it's really good to look at different data and different, different source information, and then come to get a strong, strong evidence. Also. So we, we combine the actual ribosome associated data and uh, peptide analysis data together with ex expression. Then this first exp experiment I showed at the beginning from this uh, over 800 data sets. And we found 170 retro copies that actually gave a positive signal in only three of them. Three of them. So if we would have to go to go to the lab and check it and, and uh, confirm experimental means how they did uh, and the measurable uh, set of data to uh, to confirm. Okay, so this is the this is the the, the, the pro stuff, and I, I also mentioned a lot of. Putative regulatory functions. So let's see at the dose, and maybe we can look at transcriptional interference. Uh, so apparently, actually, a lot, lot of the copies are actually inserting for their gene, uh, mostly, mostly in, in uh, generally actually introns of, of other genes. Uh, and when we found over well, 1,301 retro copies that are, lo are located in. Uh, the same as, as pro protein coding, but they are on, on opposite DNA strand. So when you think about two active genes that are on opposite DNA strand, I mean, and uh, you can easily ima ima imagine that both of these genes, these genes get trans. Uh, uh, it can get uh, transcription and interference. And there's a lot of mechanisms like promoted competition or sitting dark interference or occlusion. Polymerism, and, and there are some, some more. Uh, so, um, mm, uh, so we were wondering how it goes. I mean, if it comes to the to the ascriptionally active, active retro code. and we also found, found the work by our, uh, his colleagues uh, who investigated several non-coding genes that were nested in protein coding uh, genes. And the question from the study was, it was actually this nested, nested gene may cause cause premature termination of host, host gene transcript. Uh, so, so generally leading to the origin of sugar splice variants. Uh, so let's see if retro genes actually may have may have a function. So we we looked for candidates. And found 50 retro, retro copies that localized no more than 1,000 base pairs downstream of short isoform of the, per the particular gene in the intron, intron of another gene form. Uh, one example of those is, is this early gene that has a long, long form and two short forms. 
And in the intron of, of long form, uh, there, is this, there is this regular with the number where the four times before. And, and those are just numbers from our uh, database. Uh, we also noticed uh, that uh, this retrology is positively expression of this, of this retrology positively co correlated with short transcripts, but not with the, the long transcripts. So that was a really good sign, a good candidate to investigate further. But, but actually, you can go by far farther by informatics. I mean, just, just do informatics. So in this case, case we have to go uh, top. And take, and take advantage of CRISPR Cas9. Uh, so, what we did, we actually did two deletions in, in that promoter region of the red region. Uh, well, actually, we didn't really know where the promoter, promoter is, so a bit of guessing. Uh, we independent experiments with deletions. Uh, one or 200 base pairs, and another or 150 base pairs. Uh, uh, of course, this, you know, I mean, it takes, it takes some time to, to grow the colonies, to finish the experiment. But at the end, we did the PRs, and apparently, this deletions work, worked, worked. So, energy was sil silenced in bosses. It, it, it wasn't expressed. Uh, uh, the long splice variant was there, and one of the short splice variants was also there, the one, one. Uh, Mark and Sue, we, we see and here, we see the, see the band here is present, but this one was not. I mean, we didn't see it, and uh, we actually did some replicates, and the picture was always, always there. This place variant was dis disappeared. What's the difference between the two? This? Well, it's just, it's just one in here at the, at the, at the three prime end. end. Uh, so, uh, now we have some hypothesis that maybe actually these red heterogenes are important or take part in splicing regulation. And this part is, part is actually now a further invest investigation. Uh, so we can't, can't answer yet, uh, but this is, uh, uh, this is quite possible uh, because we thought that, okay, so if that, that uh, the retrogen is, is expressed, and there is some poly polymerase coiling. The polymerase has, has to slow down, and when it slows down, there is more time for all the uh, splicing machinery to get to get attached. Work. So maybe maybe that's why uh, that this ink splice out when the retrocopy is active. But as I said, it is still it's question mark here. Uh, and another area, I mean, another function of the competing coding and the genes are uh, because, because this cost of protein coding coding genes, they very often have conserved uh, microRNA target sites. Uh, so we, uh, here we did, I mean, different, of course, of course, and is to look if some of, some of the copies may work as, as uh, microRNA sponges. Uh, so we use, we use Miranda software, and we, we use, of course, microRNAs from eBay's and transcripts that, that we know that are expressed. Um, uh, we we um, detections uh, for copies that may, may play a role uh, as a microRNA sponge. And we actually implemented this data with expression correlation because it's always good to use some extra evidence and dance, and we actually 181, 81 retro copy uh, that could be, could be a putative relators of 250 discrete. Uh, and when we look actually at this data, we also noticed that a lot of micro, this, 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 this retro gene, I mean, got frankly connected with, with different genes. So we started to uh, look at some small, small regulatory networks. Uh, it's also worth to mention, I mean, that uh, some protein coding genes have a single copies, but there are, there are some that have even dozens, dozens of retro copies. So here we have, have a gene actually has a six different retro copies, and some of them are positively correlated with, with uh, parental genes. Some has that, that actually negatively, like be like this correlated, uh, and also found also positive expression correlation between these retro copies and also some links to, to other genes. They could regulate some, some other genes, like sponges or 
uh, sees natural transcripts, scripts, uh, a cipher in the, the really the role of this, this red uh, it's not It's not that straightforward and uh, definitely we, we uh, it, I mean, it's, ne it's necessary and to go to the lab, the lab and uh, investigate the author and find the experimental uh, evidence. But I mean, the, 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 the research I showed you so far, I mean, uh, I, th uh, I think the clearest read that the, this uh, retrogenesis are not necessarily junk, and they actually have some functions. So going back to this uh, uh, trend discover, uh, we shouldn't really put, put regions into the, the trash bin. They belong more to the recycling bin. So they are more like a recycling material that is used for some uh, other functions. Okay, I mean, we found that the, the, the express and we found that they may play, play different fun functions and some more, more probable and other maybe not so probable. Uh, but uh, the question is, is, do they really matter? I mean, so what if they get expressed? A lot of these results, or at least part of this, part of this, this result, could be could be just accidental, just by chance, chance we got relation, or, or just by chance we found some uh, some connections between retrogenesis and parent genes. Uh, but 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 maybe they are not important. Uh, well, I mean, this is the actual results from the experiments that were done in Manuan Long lab. Uh, who was working on retrocopies in Drosophila and found that the loss of some, of some retrocopies of Drosophila is vital, vital, uh, lethal. So it clearly really shows that retrocopies, uh, at least in some cases, may be essential. Uh, but Drosophila is different from human. human. I mean, you remember the, sl the slide with the number of retrocopies. Uh, Drosophila doesn't really have that many, and actually all of the copies in Drosophila are coding for proteins. Uh, they gave the function gene value, and they were kept kept in form as important and as genes. Uh, but how the mammals who has, who have I mean thousands of copies uh, of, of, of ret retro copies in the genomes? Uh, well, this is the example actually from another study. This is a study done in Elaine Ostrander group. A group published in science, science, and they look at that, that short leg, long leg, leg dogs. And what they found is, is that all short leg dogs are carriers of FGF4 retrogenes. Uh, this is some genes, genes in which it is that, um, and that's a phenotypic phenotypic result of, of this uh, retroposition. Uh, so even if in this case it's not lethal, I mean, I mean it changes this uh, phenotype of, of dogs. So again, difference between these two group, groups of dogs is just one single retrogenes. How about human? Well, there is a number of, number of uh, retrocopies that were, could were connected. Some diseases, one of the example examples is prob probably 10 people. This is the ret retrocopy of N, which is the uh, um, oncosuppressor. And 10p11 regulates this parental gene by, by comp competing with microRNA. And also, uh, how B, B uh, is known to be a tumor two, two suppressor. And this is the protein, protein coding gene, uh, retro gene. And the retrocopies of some other genes were connected with the ratings or with. Uh, so, we, so we can actually uh, show a, a, a lot of examples that, that, that may be actually important in disease development. Uh, so let's look look closer at cancer, actual actual red cancer. And I want to point out two th things in mean, general. Humans have a tumor transformation rate. We know that humans get a cancer more often than uh, that would be to be effective. And, and how we actually calculate the expectation? Uh, well, we expect that the transform tumor transformation rate uh, would be positively, positively correlate the lifespan and with the size. And why? Why? Well, because it means uh, more more cell divisions and the more cell divisions, 
the more probably the sum uh, errors would, would, would occur. Uh, although it's not a true everywhere, everywhere, it's not the real relation found in all in all orders because we have some we have some examples of resistant and uh, I must, for example, example uh, naked rat model is quite resistant to tumor, it doesn't get too much. Uh, and apparently it has a 17 copies of this pten gene, which I mentioned before, this oncosuppressor. And well, into example is, is, is also the ELA. Quite recently, it was found that the ELA fund uh, has 19 retro, retro genes of, of TP3. I mean, I mean, this is the famous oncogene gene. So pressure that's actually bro broken and it's really mutated in, in many cancers. Apparently, elephants are using these nine retro genes, 19 retro genes. So if, so if the TP53 gene, gene is broken, uh, this, this retro gene take over and the functions are actually not the start. Uh, so elephants, although they live very long, and although they have rather, rather big body mass, they don't get, get cancers. Uh, I mean, at least uh, the cancer are much, much um, less frequent than we would expect. Okay, and going, going back to high tumor transformation rate, right? uh, if we see on this screen, to be represents lineage of retrocopies. Copies. So we know that the copies originated at different points of evolution, and, and we have some that are actually shared, are shared in all Eutheria. Uh, in some lineages, we have few or dozens of uh, retrocopies, copy, but when we primates, we see a lot of them. I mean, so, so there are hundreds of those that are shared among primates, or over a thousand of those that are actually uh, uh, present in hominids. And this was during, during the action, uh, uh, there was an event which was called birth of the position. So in the evolution of primates, uh, the, the retroposition of genes was, was especially so. And, and that's why primates have, have a much higher number of retroposition genes, but of course, a lot of them are specific only for this group. So we ask, ask another question. I mean, is there a connection between, between this high transformation rate, rate and high number of, of retroposition? Uh, so we started to look now at these retrogenes in the cancer, actually in some evolutionary perspective. Uh, we decided, decided to ask our seek data from, from tumor healthy tissues, from tumors, from plant, and from dogs. Dogs Humans are obvious. Yes. Uh, dogs, a lot of, of people ask us why dogs. I mean, and we all know that, for example, mouse is a really good model organism. But the problem with mouse is there is a lot of data. Uh, uh, most of the actual, actual cancer data that, that is available are from ex experiments, are lab, and those are not naturally occurred cancers. And we really wanted to look at naturally occurred can cancers. Dogs seems, dog seems to be obvious because they, act they actually visit vets, uh, they diagnosed, they operated, so there is not only data available, but also it's uh, Possible, possible to opteria to, to do some elemental validation of informatics uh, analysis. So we used a number of tools, of course, to do quality checking and filter RNA sequences and, and estimate expression level, and then do different differential analysis. And okay. uh, when we do bioinformatics analysis, you, you really have to look, look at biology and what you actually are the animal. So here we knew the mutant genes are highly, highly similar to the anti genes. And we also have a lot of genes which are actually active, but, but still we can get some mapping in RNA-seq analysis. Uh, so we decided to limit our uh, analysis to those rna sequencing that actually two unique uh, are uniquely, uniquely matched. So if there were some reads that were matched, both retro genes and parent genes, they were excluded. This, of course, caused the underestimation of, exp of expression level, but thanks to this, with this we didn't get positive or, re or limited actual positive uh, results. Uh, so, so we got some data and, and, and we found some retro copies that were already known to be 
involved in cancer, like the, like this RP, uh, uh, on cholesterol or SFNG. Uh, we see that this one is regulated in all animals tumors. Um, this one is actually upregulated in tumors. Uh, but we found some, well, well, actually more than two, that were, that were not previously reported. Uh, for example, this retro 1605, that is down-regulated in bre breast cancer, but upregulated in liver cancer, and down-regulated in cancer. And this, and this is a retro G that is actually, actually upregulated in all, all cancer being anal analyzed. Uh, and these are just examples from human, and we also look at the dogs. Uh, this is the mammary cancer, and we see again uh, some upregulated uh, retro genes, and actually don't we already have analog data from tumor progression, and we can see that the expression of this retro gene is growing together with the tumor progression. So, so uh, this is a new, and are not very good to be uh, actionable and definitely uh, these retrogenes are worth to analyze further and look if they have any uh, true, I mean, the, the functional benefit. Uh, with the care, of course, we cannot, cannot exclude, uh, exclude, exclude that this is just by product of some other processes. Uh, okay, this is the same. So we, so we notice this both of those, those examples. And this is, this is actually a tool of retro genes of uh, CAM3. This is a gene encoding CAM modulin. Apparently, active, activity of those retro genes is lower in brain cancer. Uh, those are two retro genes of this of three, and this is the third gene of CAM3. And we first want to be down, down regulated in brain cancer. But the brain thing was, was interesting. Uh, we look at this as further. Apparently, calmodulin has an extremely high expression uh, in, uh, in brain. So this observa observation that cancer, the uh, retrocopies G are uh, um, underregulated, uh, caught our attention. And of course, this is the uh, uh, case we're investigating, getting, investigating farther. So this is actually something, you know, when you do this kind of research, you always find a lot of small interesting things and you get very often distracted. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping or maybe maybe there is really uh, some, some, some connection here. Uh, so when we look at retrogenes in cancer, we found a lot of number I mean, of, of, of retrogenes that were upregulated or downregulated in, in different years. And when we look at, look at the phylogenetries, uh, majority of them are, are actually specific for primates. Uh, so most of the genes, retrogenes that we found connected with cancer are really primate specific, some, some and are human specific. But, uh, and only a few, few of them. Uh, where were also present in some other animals. And of course, we compared our data with dogs. Um, we found two interesting genes, and how and how B and uh, HSP2 uh, that were, were actually downgulated in both, both human and dogs. So we started to look at other animals, and there is the problem actually because it's really, 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 really difficult to find the good, good data to look at all other, other animals. Uh, but so far, we found that they are active uh, in, in pig, and they also, sorry for this uh, uh, Pol Polish thing, I forgot to, got to change them, but just, you know, you know count samples from, from, from pig, from chicken, yeah. and it's also, Chicken doesn't really have a lot of retro retrocopies, uh, right? Just the, just the handful of 25 we identified. And these two that are responsible and are involved in the cancer in human and in dog, and actually in human, there is a good, good evidence uh, that they are committed cancer and, and uh, because how B, B is a suppressor. So, uh, so they so they also active in in um, um, in Shem. Uh, so, so we're looking for more data and actually uh, uh, now working with um, veterinarians and, and we call samples of of tumors from 
uh, uh, animals to see, and actually also some healthy tissues uh, to see if this is true for all, uh, at least, well, for all mammals, mammals or maybe garden, maybe uh, also chicken, but, but I'm not sure Lucky will be with materials from, uh, from Shen. Uh, so to conclude this part, I mean, a lot of, of cancer in retinal retino genes are QSFE, uh, but we also found some, some that are served in animals and that are involved in cancer, at least in human and dog, and most probably, probably also in other animals. Uh, uh, so I already, already demonstrated kind of a two type of research we did on cancer, uh, I mean on retrogenes. So what else actually retrogenes analysis may be good for, for, for evolutionary analysis? Example, this is a nice, this is a nice example of different difference between species. Uh, uh, so this is a, a retrogene of AH and GB1 gene. Uh, this is the parental gene, and this is the retrogene in human that accumulate mutations. And, and similar to RILA, there is a lot, a lot of mutation. This gene is actually to the retrogene is truncated. But when we looked at chimpanzee gene and the bonobo, uh, these sequences seem to be perfectly fine. I mean, I mean so definitely retro, retro copies. Part of the UTMTR actually is intronized, so it turned into an intron. Uh, but there are no mutations, and they seem to be coping for coding for protein. So even even so closely related related issues, we can see some important and uh, big differences when it comes to uh, comes to retrocropies. Uh, uh, but we also need to take advantage of thousand genome project project data. And again, we were actually digging double in the trash because we were mostly interested in the sequ sequence bits that were not, not marked. Mark. Everything what was put, put on and not really analyzed based on it didn't marked, it assembled, and we looked pieces and, and based on this evidence, actually we found, found 190 copies that actually were at least partially lost in some analyzed genomes from different populations. Um, so we looked at this and we actually calculated a little three frequencies of this uh, detect indels in 14 variable populations. We didn't know at the point which are, which are inserted, which are emissions. Uh, and some of them are quite specific and was said to many public, uh, I mean, in many populations, some were actually uh, quite, quite um, observed only, only in a uh, few two to, two to five populations. And we should also identified based on RNA specific data that are also in this uh, available in the Thousand Genomes Project. 11, 11 transcription with retrocopies copies that are, that are present in some, some individuals. Uh, so we, this is just an example of the map and differences in the frequencies uh, in this. Uh, so uh, the particular retrocopy copy uh, wasn't really present in over 80% or 80%, almost 80% in one case in the population. Uh, but it, it was lost only in 30 or 20 something uh, if it comes to African population. So this is just an example differences in the, in the frequencies. Of course, look at this, this 11 descriptionally active retrocopy confirmed that really they are in some genomes and in some genomes this uh, this retrocopies and copies are not present. But the big question, question was actually in insertions and no uh, uh, retrogenes, or maybe they are uh, additions. And we used the comparative genomics approach and compared this, this cell to be assembled with junk, junk. So the reads that were, were actually not uh, analyzed uh, in the, the course of thousand genome projects. And we compared these pieces with chimp chimpanzee sequence. And in cases, we actually, actually found that this retro gene was lost after, the, I mean, in the course of the evolution. Uh, so we have a transcriptionally active gene 
but this gene uh, was lost in some um, uh, people. Um, um, so we actually actually designed the primer primers from these planking pieces, and again, again the PCR experiment to experimentally validate uh, our data. And it's really actually that some that some said individuals are. Uh, homozygous for the shorter version, like here, and some are homozygous for longer versions. So they have in both alleles, they have uh, in both systems, they have the, the homologous, which they have the co copy, and some had hetero uh, individuals. So that was that proof of uh, what, we, what we did. And just I think this, I think this is the last. Uh, of, of, you can also for some other events for for, for a com combination events. Uh, when we look at the um, fusion transcripts actually, and based on the, anal the analysis of fusion transcripts, transcripts we found out that, that actually heterocopies could be, could be a recombination hotspots, similarly like uh, all um, transposable uh, elements. So it was some, something actually some new. Uh, uh, this way and, and, new, new, and new data. So concluding, concluding my three, I have just few, just few take messages uh, uh, that appears to be junk, maybe actually a valuable reservoir of materials and novel genes. Retrocopies are not junk, they are more like recycling material. Retrocopies played actually important, important role in gene evolution, and, and they also put a lot of novel, novel information, genome biology and evolution. And the last one is actually not really related to uh, retrogenes, uh, but you always need to think about, bio, about biology or bioinformatics. And I'm serious because I met, I met a lot of young people who said, well, I mean, I mean, bioinformatics is mostly about programming and it's mostly about algorithms and we don't really need much by bio in this, in this bioinformatics because the in, informatics, computer science is that matters. And of, of course, this is important, uh, but uh, if you do computer science, science biology, are you, are you really a mathematician? I mean, I mean, maybe you're a computer scientist. And I hope that, that the study show will demonstrate that, that it's really important to know what you're analyzing, then you can really select the data. You have to make a decision at all levels. Uh, so really, it's difficult to do if you don't, you don't understand basic biology, especially molecular biology, genetics, and evolution. And at the end of those, the digging in trash team. Uh, so, the, so those are my, uh, well, all of them actually, actually at some point are my PhD students, majority of them. Uh, already, already graduated, and Michal is a professor, professor, and a lot of them, of them are folks. Um, like Cla Claudia is, a, uh, is yes, the only current uh, PhD student, and she is mostly working on the uh, cancer. And of course, of course, this research uh, uh, possibly done thanks to the financial support from you know, Science Center in Poland. So, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, please share. Thank you very much, Professor, for your lecture. Um, it really gives me a lot of thought about how to do analysis. And I agree with you that biology is really important when we do bioinformatics. Um, it's very interesting to see that we have a lot of mysteries about our genome, but on the other hand, a lot of discoveries on the important roles of this so-called junk part of our genome. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and sharing your knowledge about retro genes. Um, we do have a question from one of our listeners on YouTube. Um, you mentioned it before about how we might be underestimating um, the retro genes because you were being conservative, but maybe can you explain a little bit more on be, how to be sure that we are um, that a retrogene copy is expressed um, when looking at RNA-seq data. Um, because the, the listener was saying, um, maybe the reads align to the original gene or the copy gene, uh, retrogene or both. So maybe a little bit more detail about that. 
Uh, yeah, that's 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 definitely a big d- difficulty to this. And as I mentioned, always try to be conservative. So uh, when we look at the ex- the expression used on the, the remap to ret- retrology only, not to the parent gene, which is just not always easy to do because a lot of reads, I mean, a lot of sequences conserved between two. And it's even more, more com- complicated we have, for example, dozens of retrocopies from the, from the same parental gene. Uh, so um, I know that the, the numbers we have for both of actually the number of retro genes and their expression level are heavily underestimated. But at the end, you really, you really have to go up and do, do at least your experiment, which is not that easy because you could not confirm a lot of retro copies, I mean the expression, mostly because it was impossible to to the primer that be specific for for retro copy uh, and not for parental gene. So that this is quite challenging. And actually in some incidences uh, we got chimeric chimeric transcript. Uh, so after the prior experiment we always sequence the product. Apparently, in some cases, it was in part retrogene and in part parental gene. Uh, so, so, if you re- you really focus on discoveries and want to come to some conclu- conclusions, uh, it's it's always good, you know, to, to go, go to the lab and make sure that uh, your computational predictions are, are right, right. Uh, we cannot, I mean, not, I mean, we really cannot expect, expect that some, even with the, with the stringent criteria, are false positives. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's really, really difficult to, uh, to do at, at that level. Uh, but the more evidence we get from more, sam- more samples, more different, different experiments, well, the, pr- the probability is going up, up. But this is always just for probability. Yeah, this is something we have to remember. We operate on probabilities in bioinformatics. Thank you. I very mean, much. I hope this answers answer the question. I hope so. I think it's very uh, detailed and yeah. Um, just one last question before we end. I know that you have studied many parts of the genome, not just retrogenes. What else do you think that is still uh, we have still a big question on? Uh, because right now you told us a lot of aspects that we know more about retrogenes. Are there other parts of the genome we um, more study? Uh, uh, well, definitely. I mean, there are there are long non RNAs, right? Mm-hmm. There's a, something for for a long time which we considered uh, this non-coding transcripts as just transcriptional noise or some sequence sequencing. Uh, now, of course, of course, that there is. A lot, a lot of uh, long, long coding RNAs. I think for well, for over over ninety percent of them, we don't know the functions. So similar to retrogenes, we can guess some functions like uh, RNA RNA editing or splicing mm-hmm. splicing regulation. Uh, uh, they also see micro RNA sponges uh, and natural sense transcripts. Uh, but there is still a lot of work ahead of us to to to, to decipher those. And, um, we still don't know everything. everything for example, about transposable elements, we know that over fifty percent of human genome are transposable possible elements. But again, why are we kept in, in the uh, in the genome? And I'm sure we will find uh, many more, still many more questions and quite mysterious. Elements in the gene, genomes, like regulatory elements, for example. I mean, we still don't, don't know. Uh, well, I, 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 this is the area we are still you know, digging in and, and, and studying some mechanisms and new element, elements. There is a lot of work to work for my intelligence, really. I mean, I mean, a lot of digging, maybe not in touch, but generally in genomes. Thank you. I think it's very inspiring, uh, especially for young scientists who are listening in now. Um, so thank you very much for your time and for your sharing your large knowledge with us. So 
Um, and thank you for everyone listening and have a nice day, everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, again, I mean, it was a pleasure and thanks again for inviting me. Uh, uh, I hope it was helpful. helpful. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Have a good afternoon.